The best way to describe River East, River West by Aubrey Lescure is as a book that makes you feel. It seems so simple and so reductionist to describe a novel with so many unique characters, brilliant settings, social themes explored as simply a book that makes you feel, but it is perhaps the most accurate of descriptions. I could tell you that this is set over a couple decades in developing China in modern Shanghai among the winding streets of this new globalized megapolis filled with unfamiliar expat faces. I could tell you that this is the author's debut and she so perfectly manages to hit the nail on the head. For those looking for a coming of age family drama, I could tell you that this is a novel about a 14 year old girl called Alva who's so eager to experience that American lifestyle, who wants to grow up quickly and above all else to reject her new stepfather's influence. And her stepfather, a Chinese man who was a simple clerk working in a shipyard for so many years and then suddenly became a millionaire through hard work and through perseverance. Instead, I want to tell you about how this feels and how this would make you feel. Perhaps I'm in the minority with my my opinion as there is a strong message of recovery and rediscovery, but for me, above all else, this is also a story about people who get hurt and about those who lose everything in the process. It's a story of Alva who gets hurt chasing a dream of belonging in a society that will never accept her as their own. It is a tale of loss for Lu Fang, who wants to make a life for himself as this businessman, but the political reforms and in general the events of the depression and the cultural revolution and so many other things are just not there to allow him to make it. Or the loss of Alva's friend, who wants so badly to be successful, but unlike Alva, has no other opportunity to get out. This is a tale that is profoundly emotional, profoundly melancholic. It's like a Chinese version of The Great Gatsby, a response to that false promise of the American dream. For mixed children like myself, you will find moments of similarity, moments of reaching over across time and culture and space as the author taps us on the shoulder and says you're not alone as she uncovers why none of our experiences are ever truly unique. We're never truly on our own and that is both confining and liberating. We are not alone when we don't quite know what box to take when it indicates race and ethnicity. Never quite along in that feeling that you're never just there. Not quite white but not quite Asian. <laughs> never quite a part of one group or a part of another. Something else entirely. You're never alone in wondering if national documents truly represent identity and what kind of identity do you have and what kind of identity do you have a claim to. Alva's experience as a young teenage girl wondering about who she is is an amalgamation of all those who have ever found themselves confronted with the question of race and especially those of mixed people, mixed individuals, those who wonder who am I really? This is a novel to feel sharply that stab of confusion that comes as a result of an identity crisis. That painful stab of being excluded even when you are included. It's the experience of m mixed people, of those who move around a lot, and of course those of immigrants. More than matters of race and ethnicity, there is also a stunning exploration of class here that I'm sure will be felt and understood by the majority of readers, except perhaps that one percent who has that claim that no this is not their experience it is that driving need to always be making money to always be hustling it is that desire to fulfill your own or perhaps it's your family's or perhaps it's society's expectations of wealth and opulence and of prosperity that only truly comes with money. It is that desire to be successful in the financial sense, and success as only defined by the amount of bills in your pockets and the show that you put on. It is the days of working late or missing out on family milestones because you have to work or because you have to be out there chasing goals, chasing dreams, making a career, or working in jobs where you're treated as invisible in order to stay afloat. To some extent, these questions of money will be relevant for everyone. Take, for example, Al this 14-year-old girl who wants above all else to escape to America, to finally feel American, to stop being talked about as if she's an outsider, and to move to America where she can live and realize her dreams. Except 
She can't because she has no money of her own. All she has is a passport, that coveted blue American document. And if she wants to make that progress to get into an American university, she needs to go to an international school. International schools that charge unreasonably high fees. Fees that she can only pay if she appeals to her stepfather, the very man who she wishes to avoid most of all. He is the only man to pay her fees. So... She's forced to compromise, she's forced to make deals in order to get him to pay for her education. Or take for example Lu Feng himself, that stepfather. He was forced for so many years to work in a shipyard. He worked the hardest in his school. People thought that he was going to be an imperial scholar and then all of a sudden he got sent to a province town to retrain amidst the Cultural Revolution and then he was forced to marry a, a provincial woman who he didn't really like but he needed to take that opportunity to get out. And he's still acutely feels the scorn that people give him, even in hospitals, when they hear his wife's strong accent, or when they treat him as not quite there, when he's not flashing his money or wearing expensive belts and parading a thick wallet around. Even Zoe, um, one of the American expat kids who's rich, who's loaded, even she herself, for whom money is not a problem, who throws money, in fact, at every problem, treats it as the way to fill the emotional void, will never quite have enough to fill the emotional void that was left behind by her parents not really being there, by putting on this perfunctory show of we're a perfect family, look at us, we're living the life, we're rolling around in money, when there are so many underlying problems. Along with feeling, this is a novel that will make you think, and particularly it will make you think about wealth and the numerous questions that arise as a result of money and of wealth. Was it worth it? Are these extra hours worth it? What is more important, making that extra dollar or saving here and there? Or do you feel that cultural gap when you go to a place and everyone seems to operate on a set of unwritten rules and you're scorned and treated as lesser or things that are familiar become unfamiliar? Is it worth it to sacrifice dreams and ambitions to pay those extra bills? The novel feels claustrophobic and confining, exactly that same sense of feeling that would arise when you're in the atmosphere that these characters are now. To have to be constantly chasing money in order to survive, to stay afloat. They can't think of anything else when they are so dependent on money. We are so fortunate to not know the extent of poverty that many of these characters feel, especially Elva's friend that I mentioned earlier, that unlike her doesn't have a rich stepfather and another passport to rely on. But at the same time, we... We feel acutely our privilege, but we also feel the sense of empathy and understanding that comes from a well-written story that truly shows you other perspectives. We understand these characters, even if we can never understand that endless push for money, that endless need to survive. We understand these characters because they are presented to us in a way that is understandable. We know their backstories, we know their ambitions, we know their drives, we know their desires. There's so much darkness concealed amongst these pages, so many instances of suicide, of parental neglect, of consumption of minors being exploited and groomed. Like I said, this is a novel about loss and all the things that we lose. And what we, what you feel perhaps most of all is a sort of emptiness, a sort of void. It's draining and it's exhausting to constantly be amongst these myriads of lives that all have their own unique problems and difficult social circumstances. And yet you can't tear yourself away because Aubrey Lesquire so masterfully weaves these two dual halves of Alva and her stepfather and the ways that in which they are similar even if they would like to think that they're not. And the snappiness, the rhythm, the structuring of this novel, it's, it's so exhilarating that you simply can't think of anything else. These characters are all so lifelike and yet so well developed. They have their unique flaws, they are not quite likable, but yet they capture that essence of life. They feel raw, they feel real. There is so much lying, so many problematic and 
terrible decisions and so many attempts at solutions that somehow make everything infinitely worse. And it's refreshing to read about real people with real problems and people who are above all else just trying to live and just trying to stay afloat. East or West, there are always people everywhere trying to live. Even if they're difficult to like, but the balance that is stricken between the character driven aspect and the plot driven aspect makes it considerably easy for us to follow the story and to consider all of the complicated feelings that the characters experience. These characters ultimately also serve as tools to develop on the socio-economical themes that I talked about earlier, but they never quite feel like tools, they're never quite exploited, they do feel like real people. And while it is perhaps a story that you have heard before, it's done well, and the compelling storyline makes it fascinating to explore these two worlds. At times it feels, because this is also a political novel, as invariably novels that touch on such difficult subjects are, that it leans too much to, towards one side or the other. That for the author it is sometimes too easy to rush to conclusions, criticizing China and presenting America as the ideal, even if all the villains are predominantly American. But I admire that there is a very visible effort in this novel to present both sides, and indeed that tilt and that lean could be coming from Alva's perspective, and from the perspective of many of these characters who have internalized that belief that, oh, somehow it's that, like, idea of this perfect white community coming in to save and fix the backwards culture of of the East. And I like that it highlights that this is not the truth, but it also show you that it's also not the truth that this East civilized form will somehow fi fix the decadence and the corruption of the West. It just shows you and it focuses on these issues to show that there are evils in every country and evils in every place. And the grass is not greener on the other side. And I like that there is a reversal of this. And that duality, that current of this East and West, it runs throughout the story, and it's interesting to consider the ways that it shifts and changes, and in which moments the East dominates and in which moments the West does. And that melancholy I mentioned earlier, it's hard to tell whether it comes from the characters who make you wait and hold with your bated breath to see what's going to happen next and what decisions they're going to take, or whether it comes from the confusion of flitting between these two different worlds and societies. Or is it maybe just the wealth of emotions that this book produces from pity to empathy to fury. This is a reverse immigrant story, and it's nice to have that fresh perspective brought to the table. Like I said, that balance of not having the West as the savior and the East as like the spiritual guide of truly acknowledging that both sides have their problems. We finally understand that everywhere has its evils and even if you're escaping from a set of them you're really running into another set and sometimes you might actually be bringing them with you. It's an interesting discussion on the nature of expats and what they can do to a community, that sense of lawlessness and the gray zone that comes from expats in a foreign countries where, especially in countries where people view themselves as somehow lesser to the West and they internalize that position. It's an interesting exploration of a different side to the coin because we so glamorize these expat lifestyles that it's good to consider the impact that this might have on local community. The gift is in the details and it's brilliant to have so many cultural references, Chinese characters, Chinese phrases. It feels very Im immersive. Uh, certain phrases are left for us to interpret and they're not explained and they're in their own natural conflict context and it feels like that's exactly how it's supposed to be. And also for a Mandarin learner, it doubles that sense of naturalness of the story as not just something from the West, again, looking at the East experience, but something of both cultures, of someone who has truly experienced and lived through these two worlds. And reading this book, I thought for sure that it's one of the strongest picks on the shortlist so far. And indeed, I think that there is something in this for everyone. For example, for pa uh, for fans of Pachinko, that sense of a multi-generational family saga, even if it covers far fewer decades, and there is more of a focus on kind of the emotional and the political economic aspects of it. The 
novel is far more alive than other novels that I've read so far, and it suffers less from the sensationalized kind of plot twists and literary devices that seem to be popular on this year's shortlist so far. It's real, and it's less about the beauty and the glamour of talking about social topics, ooh, how enlightening, and more about showing how something really is. It's not an easy plot with a linear direction, and for me this was definitely a work that tests your patience. The end result was gratifying and simply breathtaking, because it was vivid in its imagery and simplicity of character. It doesn't pretend to be anything that it is not. It's so painful, but also so joyful, and you'll feel so many emotions that at some point it becomes easier to count the emotions that you don't feel rather than counting all the things you've felt and all the things you've thought. I really can't think of a better book to read in quiet self-reflection self on a lonely and grey day. And frankly, even with this book's flaws, even with the occasional difficulty of keeping up with the story or the occasional feeling that maybe it's leaning too much in one way, or the dialogue is too used, or this has all been done before, I still feel that this is definitely a story to read and to recommend, and above all else, to discuss and to talk about. So thank you so much for watching my review, I hope you enjoyed it, and please do stay tuned for other reviews of the shortlist!